today on the Everything 80s podcast, the top 10 cartoons of the 1980s. Hey there, what's happening? Welcome back to the Everything 80s podcast. I'm Jamie. Thanks for coming on out today. They shaped our lives and became the definition of must-see TV before that was even a thing. With very little other forms of entertainment, cartoon shows provided the ultimate in amusement for kids growing up in the 80s. And that's why today I want to look at the top 10 80s cartoons. So before we start all that, if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe wherever you find your podcast. I should be there. So the 80s is a golden age of a lot of things, music, movies, technology, all that sort of thing, but also a golden age of cartoons. And a lot of this is thanks to what I've covered a lot on the show, the deregulation that happened in children's programming by Ronald Reagan when he first became president. Companies now had free reign to push anything they wanted at kids. Before that, there were restrictions on what could be directly targeted and marketed towards children. But with these restrictions lifted, there came a tidal wave of cartoons and toys associated with it. We weren't complaining though, and we were the ones reaping all the benefits. In a lot of cases, we were unaware that we were basically just watching a 22 minute commercial when we watched a cartoon, but we love what we saw. There was a 300% increase in um, licensed characters going into the 80s. That's how much this deregulation just launched this era of cartoons and toys. Okay, so we're going to go in the top 10 order and look at each cartoon and a few little fun facts about it and why I think it ranks in as some of the best cartoons of the 80s. Okay, number 10, She-Ra, Princess of Power. So how do you capitalize on the success of a massively... Um, iconic franchise. You spin it off, of course. She-Ra, Princess of Power came out in 1985 and was done to push the massively popular He-Man cartoon and toy line, but directed more at young girls. Regardless of whether you were a boy or a girl, She-Ra was a great cartoon and embraced all the elements that made He-Man and the Masters of the Universe so successful. You you know, there, growing up in the 80s, there was obviously a lot of specific gender differences that were really pushed by manufacturers and toy companies. And there was that very clear divide between a boy's toy and a girl's toy and whatever. And, you know, She-Ra as a cartoon was so good. It appealed to everybody. And it was because it was so connected to Masters of the Universe, you knew some of the backstory. In this case, it was She-Ra Uh, Princess Adora, who's the twin sister of Adam slash He-Man. She lives in Eternia. Uh, Instead of Skeletor, though, she has an adversary in Hordak. She's leading the rebellion against him. It's part of the whole universe. So it was um, what I thought it was an amazing cartoon as much as, you know, my sister liked it and I didn't want to watch anything she normally did. This one was a bit different. Cartoon also features a lot of great supporting characters like Light Hope, Madam Raz, Cal, um, Bo Glimmer. she though, would only last two seasons, but put an impressive 93 episodes together with its also very successful toy line, making it a huge part of the 1980s. Okay, number nine, Inspector Gadget. Inspector Gadget was a definitive part of the 80s and a cartoon that everyone watched, at least for a little while. It was um, one of the one of those shows like again you might not have been that invested in it but you no one didn't know about inspector gadget it had one of the catchiest cartoon theme songs ever written uh, inspector gadget you know in case you don't remember it, it told the story of a bumbling half man half cyborg his niece penny his dog brain and his advers- adversary the evil dr claw Inspector Gadget was put out by Dick Entertainment in 1983, and the original pilot had a very different feel to what you may remember. That original um, Inspector Gadget had a he had a completely different voice. He had a mustache and was more of a ripoff of Inspector Clouseau. They ended up being forced into changing all this into the show you're now you're now familiar with. Inspector Gadget carries on a theme created from an old cartoon called. The Blue Falcon and Dino Mutt, where Dino Mutt was outfitted with a lot of contraptions similar to Inspector Gadget. It was like a Scooby Doo kind of Inspector Gadget cross. There's also, again, that iconic theme song. And if you've 
ever listen to it closely and you know your classical music, it takes a lot of its influence from Hall of the Mountain King by Edward Grieg. It also takes some influence from the Pink Panther theme song, and it actually wasn't even created until the morning of its recording. That's how last second this thing was, but like, you know, many other iconic uh, songs and music, it sort of just happened naturally and worked out. Okay, number eight, the GoBots. There, this may be a surprise in the top 10 80s cartoons, but I love the GoBots, even though they're sometimes considered the poor man's Transformers. But the cartoon and the toys debuted before Transformers did, and they paved the way for a lot of the success of Transformers. The GoBots also originate in Japan as Machine Robo, and it was actually truck makers Tonka that brought them to North America. The Challenge of the GoBots cartoon came out on September 8, 1984, nine days before Transformers debuted. It features the evil Renegades versus the Good Guy Guardians and included characters like Leader One and Psykill. The cartoon was put together by Hanna-Barbera and they put out a massive 65 episodes over just one season. Everything you see in Transformers as far as backstory, mythology, character development, and themes were all originated by the GoBots. The cartoon even featured the voices of Frank Welker and Peter Cullen, who voiced Megatron and Optimus Prime. When the GoBots first debuted on TV, I was out of my mind excited for it. The problem was it came on before I got home from school, and this is like pre-VCR days, or I mean VCRs were around, but like... Very few people had them. They were so expensive. So I knew it was debuting and there was no way I'd be able to get to see it. So I faked being sick for four straight days to be able to watch this show. So I don't know how I pulled this off as a kid, but this is how important this was to me. Okay, number seven, Garfield and Friends. Garfield and Friends was a cartoon that was embraced by all ages and featured one of the most famous comic strip characters ever. Cartoons based on characters like these, you know, like the Peanuts, Charlie Brown, always have a good chance of succeeding because everyone is already familiar with the characters. In this case, it's, you know, Garfield, John, Odie, Nermal. Garfield and Friends was a very successful cartoon and ran a lot longer than most ever do. It debuted on September 17, 1988 and ran until December 10, 1994 on CBS for a total of 121 episodes. This cartoon was interesting in that it didn't follow the regular format of other cartoons. There would be original stories, but it would also feature short 30 to 45 second Garfield quickies, like a sketch comedy show. This, this show is very creative and a little bit... Not necessarily ahead of its time, but a little more out of the box compared to regular run-of-the-mill cartoons. Garfield and Friends is also unique as it was one of the last remaining cartoons of Saturday mornings, which had begun a serious decline. The ratings were so good that this allowed it to last a lot longer than most of its competition. But since CBS had to cut its cartoon budget, the show had to pack it in. Okay, number six, Thundercats. One of the coolest cartoons ever with one of the greatest theme songs to go with it. The Thundercats were a group of feeling like humanoids and basically like the Broadway show of cats, but on steroids. Thundercats ran from 1985 to 1989 and was actually co-produced by Rankin Bass Animated Entertainment, which of course brought us the iconic Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer Christmas special. This show, however, was a purely Japanese animated cartoon, but would be produced, written, and voice acted in the United States. Marvel Comics would even put out a series based on the cartoon, and it feels like this property still could have some life in it. It really seems like it lends itself to some sort of remake popping up, whether it's a full, you know, a CGI Netflix series or a standalone movie. I think it's got some legs still in it, and I'm kind of surprised nothing has come up yet with Thundercats, but I feel it will. Okay, number five, The Muppet Babies. Everyone loved the Muppet Babies, whether you wanted to admit it or not. Whereas most cartoons were designed to sell a toy line, and it's not like the Muppet Babies didn't, the focus always seemed to be a bit more on creativity. Commerce is always the name of the game, but with the Muppet Babies cartoon, their intentions seemed to genuinely be about entertaining and inspiring kids. This is the takeaway that I got from it, and at the core of the show was the idea of using your imagination. This was another cartoon that had a low barrier of entry because everyone in the world is familiar with the Muppet characters, so putting out cute baby versions in cartoon form couldn't miss. 
The series came out in 1984 and ran impressively until November 2nd, 1991 on CBS. The idea of putting forth a cartoon show based on the Muppets as babies was introduced in the movie The Muppets Take Manhattan in the dream sequence by Miss Piggy. The sequence was so popular, it's what inspired Henson to create the cartoon. The Muppet Babies would focus on adventure and include popular movies interconnected with real-life clips. The creativity and imagination that was the focal point was obvious due to this being a Jim Henson production. Henson's priority was always to entertain, inspire, and create magic, and the show was able to do that. Also, the show was produced by Marvel Productions, of all people. Muppet Babies was so popular that they would take 30-minute episodes and put them into 60- and 90-minute blocks of programming. They would continue to air as reruns into 1992. They were also so successful it inspired other productions to create baby versions of their main characters, including a pup named Scooby-Doo, the Flintstone Kids, Tiny Toon Adventures, Tom and Jerry Kids, the Jungle Cubs. So all in all, the Muppet Babies was for sure one of the top 10 cartoons, I think, of the 80s. It also includes the amazing fact that Frank Welker, a.k.a. Megatron, did the voice of Baby Kermit. That's, I, that's the fact of the podcast right there, if you're taking away anything. Okay, number four, Voltron, Defender of the Universe. Voltron was awesome and definitely belonging in the top ten cartoons here. It could have been a bit higher on the list, but it just can't, can't compare to the mythology that you'll see from the top three. Voltron is based on the story of a team of space explorers who pilot a giant super rob- robot, Voltron, Defender of the Universe. This show came out on September 10th, 1984. And to me, this was one of the coolest toys of all time. But it didn't lend itself to much more than just the five main toys. There weren't a ton of vehicles, play sets, and other characters that you would find compared to things like G.I. Joe or Transformers. Voltron was a little different than other cartoons in that it was a fully syndicated show. This allowed for cheaper production as you didn't have to have an original air date slot on TV and it can be aired at various times. Voltron ran from 1984 to November 18th, 1985 and was actually the highest rated syndicated children's show for two years during the original run. When a show is made to be syndicated like this, uh, Small Wonder is another example that did this. It, there's no way for a show like this to not make money because the the air rights are, are just dropped through the floor. There's They don't have to spend the majority of their budget um, on original air date slots. But it's Voltron was up against a lot of competition. The one thing that also came with it was the huge amount of spinoffs over the years, which ultimately made it su- successful, even though it only ran from 84 till 85. But those spinoffs include Gladiator Voltron, Voltron Fleet of Doom, Voltron the Third Dimension, Voltron Force, Voltron Legendary Defender. Voltron's still been going strong some 34 years after it debuted, showing what an original and impactful cartoon show it really was. Okay, we're into the top three. And depending on your viewpoint, this top three could be very interchangeable. But this, I think, my perspective on why I slot them in as I do. Okay, number three, G.I. Joe. And this could, of course, be first on the list. Um, They, yeah, it's, it's so hard. It took a while to go through these. So trust me, this wasn't just completely off the top of the head. So not a lot has to be said about G.I. Joe, and it exists as one of the longest-running toys out there going back to the 60s. If it wasn't for Star Wars, we might not have G.I. Joe as we know it. So if you know your toy history, G.I. Joe started out as a 12-inch figure, and due to increasing oil prices, uh, action figures like this, also like the ones Star Star Wars would release in the late 70s, had to be shrunk down to save costs. G.I. Joe observed this and the success of Star Wars and would go on to reintroduce G.I. Joe in this new smaller format, the three and a half inch size action figures that you know. This is where cartoons and marketing start to blur as G.I. Joe was one of the first properties that would take advertising to children to another level. Even though we loved it, the cartoon completely served as a 22-minute commercial to introduce new toys, characters, and vehicles. It's why you may notice in every episode, characters are referred to by their full names and vehicles are described by their full name just like you would see on the packaging in the stores. Over the course of the cartoon, Hasbro would release 250 different vehicles alone. 
But of course, we were kids and didn't give a crap because all of this was amazing. The toy line came out in 1982 along with a Marvel comic series to introduce everything. This would be followed by 30 second commercials pr to promote the toys, which were so successful it led to a five part mini series that came out in 1983. A second five part series came out in 1984 called The Revenge of Cobra and G.I. Joe would then become a full series in 1985. They had to crank out another 55 episodes pretty quick as 65 were required for syndication and that way this could get them on during the coveted after school slot on TV. And again, that is the must see TV of our day. The after school time slot was the holy grail of children's cartoons besides Saturday morning, of course, but this was a weekly regular occurrence due to the violent nature of this show. They weren't allowed to show firearms being used um, on and on anyone. Like there's no direct kill shots. No one is killed on screen. You know, there's a lot of violence, but there's no sort of resulting end from the violence. It's a lot of missed shots. It's a lot of, stormtroopers never making hits with their you know blasters kind of um feel to it even though it is essentially a violent show uh, but because this this is one of the um regulations that actually was put in place because it was a violent show they would have to follow each episode with a public safety lesson that we all know about uh being knowing as the half the battle little gi joe vignettes at the end of the show. So, I mean, they were taking responsibility, but more because they were forced to do it. Okay, number two, He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. This is a tough one, and G.I. Joe could easily be in the spot, but to me, He-Man captured the imagination a bit more than G.I. Joe. When you watch anything to do with G.I. Joe or the toys, it's already familiar. Army-based toys and entertainment have been around since the advent of TV and movies. With He-Man, you were getting something more mythical and engaging. The story of Adam of Eternia that can transform into He-Man is a stuff of fantasy for little kids. It's one of the few 80s cartoons that was a totally original idea and one that did things a bit differently. Whereas the other cartoons were made primarily to launch a toy line, He-Man started with the toy line and then evolved into the cartoon show. You might forget how far back He-Man goes, and I always think of it as a mid-80s franchise, but the toy goes all the way back to 1982, with the cartoon going back to 1983. He-Man got a lot of inspiration from Conan the Barbarian, and was quite an interesting cartoon, as this was still in the early days of that deregulation I was talking about. Before this, a lot of censorship was applied to cartoons, and He-Man was one of the first that featured an overly muscled character and one that actually was hitting people. That wasn't really a thing before that. He-Man was still controversial because as the toys came out, people realized all this was a combination of advertising and promotion. To offset this a bit, He-Man would feature life lessons or moral of the story at the end of each episode, similar to the knowing is half the battle. Either way, He-Man was an epic cartoon and as epic as cartoons could get it's clearly obvious good guys versus clearly obvious bad guys it had action humor mythology and the quintessential superhero of the 80s all rolled into one okay the number one cartoon of the 80s and no surprise here you probably saw where this was going anyway transformers it has to be number one the perfect combination of action, adventure, transforming robots, and toys you wanted more than life itself. It is also the ultimate in a cartoon series used to launch a toy lineup. Originally from Japan, the Transformers started their lives as the Diaclone toy line before being uh, borrowed by Hasbro at the Tokyo Toy Fair in 1983. Everything was there from the beginning with the Diaclone toys, and all Hasbro needed to do was come up with new character names and backstories. They would actually turn to our old friends Marvel again to help develop more of the mythology, and the cartoon would start out as a three-part series and four-part comic book series. The three-part series debuted in September 1984, and was an obvious massive hit right away. The next season, or technically the first season, included 13 episodes that had already been commissioned before the three-part series had even aired. They were pretty confident in how well the toys were going to go over, and they nailed this one. Even though commerce is at the heart of the Transformers, but it's isn't it for all cartoons and toy shows, really, 
there still was a lot of creativity. There was a lot of character development. There was a lot of story arcs that took place over the coming seasons. The story of the battle between the Autobots and Decepticons is a pivotal part of the childhood of many kids in the 80s, mine included. So when I think of the 80s and I think of cartoons, it's Transformers that is always the first that comes to mind. And that's why it's number one on my list of the top 10 80s cartoons. So I'll start wrapping it up here. Hopefully I've covered my bases pretty well. You might have a few favorites that didn't make the cut, like Rubik the Amazing Cube, which I just did a whole show about. Uh, but I think I covered the universal choices. And then it's just a few of the slotting positions you might disagree with. But some of these cartoons looking back don't hold up as we remember. But it's really the memory of the time that stays with us. Saturday mornings and after school were a sacred time and a cartoon utopia that just does not exist today. There's nothing wrong with being able to stream anything on demand and having it at your fingertips, but having designated times to see the very best in entertainment will always be remembered fondly, I think. So I'll finish it there. Thank you for listening. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this show. I know there's a ton of podcasts out there, so the fact you're using your time to listen when this listen to this one means quite a lot. Uh, again, if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe wherever you find your podcast. I should be there. If you really like it, leave it a rating and review. That way more people get to see it but i appreciate your time i will be back soon with a new show don't you dare miss it